you. So I am very excited about our next speaker. Okay. Get this to Height. <laughs> so in 2009, the Good News Club came to her daughter's school, and in 2012, she published this book, The Good News Club, The Christian Right Stealth Assault on America's Children. Everyone in this room should read this book. If you have children in school or grandchildren in school, you absolutely must read this book. And if you happen to know that the Good News Club is coming to one of your schools, you ought to buy 10 copies and then distribute them to parents in your community. Or at least donate them to the library so people can... This is a really, really important book for you to read. Um, the book's focus is not just on the club, but on the Christian right's other goal, where if we can't get into the schools, then we'll just destroy them. Uh, the chapter on the Texas textbooks nearly brought me to tears. Um, so the author has written several other books, and she writes regularly for Newsweek, The London Times, The Guardian, Reuters, Rolling Stone, and The New York Times. So let's give a warm FFRF welcome to Catherine Stewart. Thank you so much. I'm really grateful to be here. Um, thank you to uh, Annie Laurie Gaylor and um, Dan Barker for everything they do. And, uh, a special thanks to the FFRF legal team who are on the front lines of all of this, uh, the assault on American uh, education and children. I hear that the FFRF gets, uh, this year they're about to hit 2,000 complaints, uh, and about half of those come from, uh, are related to religion and public schools. So this is an issue that I think should be, you know, of concern to everybody. I've spent the last four years researching the Good News Club, and other initiatives by religious radicals to infiltrate and undermine public education in America. And what has surprised me the most is just how effective these radical groups have been at inserting their religious programs into our schools and at degrading support for public education as a whole. The issue should be of concern not only to parents and activists and grandparents, but also to school administrators, educators, and indeed everybody who cares about the future of our country as a modern secular democracy. Now I want to tell you something about the path that brought me here. I didn't go looking for this issue. The story came to me, and it started with one of those events that at first seemed so small you scarcely notice it until suddenly you're living in a whole new world. Four years ago, I was living in sun-spangled Santa Barbara, California, with my husband, our five-year-old girl, and our baby boy. When you think about Santa Barbara, you just don't picture the culture wars. The only uh, culture wars I can remember were between the Pinot drinkers and the Syrah drinkers. <laughs> Go Team Syrah. <laughs> and then one day I heard that something called a Good News Club was coming to our daughter's public elementary school. Look, my first reaction was that this was no big deal. What could be bad about a group called the Good News Club? The program described itself as Bible study from a non-denominational standpoint. But, uh, you know, I'm a big free speech advocate, and I also ha happen to think that the Bible and other religious texts are worth studying, even in public schools, from a non-sectarian standpoint, as literature, history, or anthropology. But I started to hear uh, stories from parents around town whose kids went to schools where Good News Clubs had recently been established. And I started hearing about how kids, uh, the clubs were turning kids into faith-based bullies. One little boy, Cole, whose family is atheist, was told by several classmates that he was going to go to hell because he didn't believe in Jesus. The Good News Club boys, they were the one who told him this, they said that their religion had to be true because a teacher taught it to them in their very own school. Oh, it is true because they teach it at school, said uh, one of the little boys. A little Jewish girl named Zoe got into a fierce argument on the playground with Ashley, who was attending a Good News Club. When the teacher uh, tried to break it up by explaining that different religions have different perspectives, Ash uh, Zoe was fine with this, but Ashley burst into tears. I know it must be true, she sobbed, because they taught it to me in school, and they don't teach things in school that aren't true. How can they lie to us in school? 
These stories get to the heart of the trouble with good news clubs. I don't have a problem with kids talking about their religion with their friends at school. But I do have a problem with kids being deceived into thinking that their school favors a particular religion and kids being encouraged to use that misleading information to bully and try to convert their peers. That perception on the part of these kids is no accident. Good News Clubs, and by the way, there are over 3,000 of them in public elementary schools in America. Actually, the number is probably closer to 4,000. Good News Clubs use the school's cloak of authority to convert kids as young as four or five years old to a fundamentalist form of evangelical Christianity by giving them the false but unavoidable impression that the school endorses a particular form of the Christian faith. There was a curious thing about the appearance of a Good News Club at our school. As far as we could tell, nobody in the parent body had invited them in. Not only that, there was no shortage of Bible study in the community already. In fact, the school was right next door to an evangelical church, and uh, many of the school's parents worked in the evangelical college up the road. Sometimes it seemed like we were surrounded by Bible study. Every Sunday, this is Southern California, every Sunday we had Bible study groups on the beaches. We had a Bible study group for beach volleyball players, and we had a surf church, <laughs> um, a fundamentalist surf church, and uh, of course hundreds, hundreds of kids' programs in the many dozens of churches in our little town. We had more Bible study groups than palm trees. A group of parents met with the Good News Club leaders and asked if they would consider setting up their class at the evangelical church next door to the school where there was an even better space available and for free. But they adamantly refused. They desperately wanted to be in the school. So why did they need to put their Bible study group in our public school? Who were the people behind the Good News Clubs? And what did they believe? Is what they were doing legal and consistent with the constitutional principle of the separation of church and state? I spent four years researching the topic. I attended Good News Clubs in different public schools and talked to their leadership. I went to a Good News Club training sessions, joined a mission project in Boston, and attended uh, one of their national conventions in Alabama. I have some answers. The first question, what is the religion of the Good News Club? Well, it turns out that it is not just any old kind of Christianity. Let me give you an example. This is one of their training manuals. Sorry. Um, these manuals are uniformly uh, used in every Good News Club. They're, they're sort of a, a standard curriculum, and so these uh, manuals are used from coast to coast in every Good News Club. Now here's the second weekly lesson in this standardized series of lessons. I should, you know, these, these lessons are highly scripted and the instructor is given a very specific plan of what to say that covers the 60 minute class, minute by minute. There is no room for deviation or spontaneous reinterpretations. There's a, a party line and teachers uh, sign statements uh, promising to stick to it. Now you may remember the story of the Amalekites in the first book of Samuel. The Israelites are having trouble with their neighbors, the Amalekites, and God orders Saul to exterminate them all, including the children and the babies. Saul does his best to carry out the deed. He kills off the women, the children, the babies, the men, um, and most of the livestock, but he spares the king and some of the tastier looking animals. According to the scripture, God is outraged by Saul's failure to execute the order in full. It's an interesting and challenging story. I'm sure it can be interpreted in many ways by biblical scholars, but I do want to note that it has a history of showing up when one sectarian group has its sight set on eliminating and exterminating uh, their rivals, uh, Rwanda and Northern Ireland being just two of the many examples. But the relevant point here is that the Good News Club thinks that this is the story that should be brought to the attention of five and six-year-old children in public schools. The lesson the Good News Club wants to teach is quite clear. If God gives you the order to kill everybody, you must do it to the letter, or you are committing the sin of disobedience. As the Good News Club manual specifies, 
uh, children are instructed to say to the kids, if only God had asked Saul for the strength to obey, right over here. And in three separate places in this lesson plan, three separate places, it tells teachers, here says, teaching statement, have the children shout, God will help you obey. With a fundamentalism this deep and an emphasis on obedience at all costs, it is perhaps no surprise that the Good News Clubs and their sponsoring organization, the CEF, are represented at their national conventions by extremists who rail against the so-called homosexual agenda, promote creationism, seek to undermine women's reproductive freedom, and condemn interfaith marriage, referred to by one keynote speaker as interracial marriage. As I learned more about the culture of the Good News Club and the CEF, something kept nagging me. These groups meet a lot of resistance in school communities, as they did in ours. They create division among formerly friendly neighbors. And perversely, the Good News Club leaders often seem thrilled about that strife. They seem to operate with indifference to the school community, or even a kind of hostility toward it. The religious right wing often claims to promote small town values and act as though they are the last defenders of the American family. But division among neighbors is not, to my mind, a small town value. At the CEF's national convention, I heard members of the organization talk about breaking down the doors to the public schools. Some spoke about kicking in the doors. At a seminar on securing permission to enter the schools, Good News Clubs that met with resistance from school communities were urged to sue. They were offered an 800 number and promised legal, uh, free legal representation. We're in a battle with Satan, said Matt Staver, the founder and leader of Liberty Council and a keynote speaker at the convention. Satan is a strategist of war. What I finally came to understand is that the people in the movement, or at least the people behind the movement, would actually be happy to see the public schools fail. They think public education is evil. Public education in its current non-religious form is Satan. When Staver describes public schools, as he did at the National Convention of the Child Evangelism Fellowship, he said, tanks are there on the playground. Bullets are being hurled over kids' heads as they are in the classrooms. The mushroom clouds are billowing. Now, it's hard for me to square Staver's visions with my experience of the places my kids learn their times tables and memorize state capitals. But for such extremists, if you have to destroy the school community in order to save it, that seems to be a pretty good deal. Their philosophy seems to be, if you can't own it, break it. Here's another troubling feature of the Good News Clubs, and my second point. The leaders of the Good News Club and the Child Evangelism Fellowship rely on deceit, convincing five- and six-year-old kids that their religion is affiliated with and sanctioned by the schools isn't just a byproduct of their activity. It is part of a conscious program they know very well that five-year-olds can't make a distinction between what's taught in the school uh, and what they learn from other teachers at that same school at that same time. It all has that cloak of authority. Another level of deceit has to do with how they represent their beliefs. They systematically make an effort to present themselves as broadly Christian with these non-threatening labels like interdenominational and non-denominational. But in fact, most activists I met who work with the Child Evangelism Fellowship believe that most Americans who call themselves Christians really aren't, including um, uh, United Church of Christ, to U.S. Episcopalians, United Methodists, the list goes on. Of course, they categorically reject the legitimacy of all other faiths. And free thinkers are enemy number one. <laughs> Now, it's not just that they misrepresent their beliefs to the general public. The surprising thing is that they make an effort to misrepresent the beliefs to the parents who send their kids to the club with their permission. 
I attended a workshop with one of the leaders of the CEF's Spanish ministries, who explained to a room full of Good News Club teachers how they should phrase their introduction and lesson plans so as not to alert the Catholic parents that the real aim of the club is to convert their children away from papist idolatry and to the only true religion, their religion, and thus save those Catholic children from an eternity in hell. A third thing I learned is that the movement is intensely focused on the most vulnerable among us, our children. In the course of my research, I attended several conferences and festivals for evangelical missionaries. What I learned is that over the past 10 years, the missionary universe has undergone a dramatic change in focus. It used to be about converting poor countries, what they called unreached people groups, unreached parts of the globe. They called that the 1040 window, based on the idea that the countries that happened to need the most attention were between 10 and 40 north latitude. And so thousands of missionaries were dispatched to Africa and the Middle East, um, and if you look at the globe, you'll see that most of these areas fall between 10 and 40 north latitude. The 1040 uh, uh, term was coined by a missionary strategist named Louise Bush, who's a very high-level strategist. Now, today, the new thinking in the missionary world is that your target must be young people, very young people. Here's another quote from Matt Staver at that CEF convention. Anyone who studies warfare knows you focus on the most strategic part of the human chain link. If you're trying to direct the largest cruise ship in the world, you focus on the one tiny thing in the cabin there that will ultimately change the rudder to change direction of the entire cruise ship. You focus on the youth. If you want to change the face of the planet, he said, you focus on those children ages 5 to 12. It is the most strategic age group that we have. So in the missionary world right now, it's not geography that matters, it's age. That high-level mission strategist I referred you, uh, to early, earlier, Louise Bush, he in fact coined that term 1040 window. He noted that 85% of all conversions to Christianity occur between the ages of 4 and 14. He has a a, a graph that shows that, and that's used in uh, some of the CEF presentations. Um, he published this book called, he came up with this new idea called the 414 window. His book is called the 414 window, raising up a new generation to transform the world. And this book has become a seminal text in the world of evangelical mission strategy. Here's a quote from the introduction to the book. Even the Taliban places great emphasis on recruiting children. He, um, uh, the intro notes and, and continues, may God inspire you to join us in his battle for the little ones. The fourth thing I learned is that the Good News Club is really a product of extremely aggressive legal advocacy, which is now enshrined in a, in a crucial Supreme Court decision. Let me tell you about it. In 2001, the Supreme Court ruled in a case called Good News Club versus Milford Central School. The court held that religion is nothing more than speech from a certain point of view. Religion is not religion after all, it's just speech from a certain point of view. And therefore, these religious activities are protected by the free speech clause of the First Amendment. And uh, that the courts uh, in that decision pushed free speech so far that the Establishment Clause of the Constitution, which prohibits government endorsing or funding of an establishment of, of religion, has been eviscerated. They've used the distinction between school-sponsored speech and student speech as a kind of loophole. The Supreme Court opened the doors, and now programs like the Good News Club are turning public schools into what they call mission fields. Now, this is a dramatic reversal of how the Supreme Court was ruling for most of the 20th century. Until 2001, a certain judicial philosophy reigned um, on school church issues um, in the highest court. That philosophy took seriously the coercive effect of school authority on small children. And it understood that um, Secularism involves, in a general way, neutrality on religion that is neither endorsing nor favoring and not taking a stand either for or against 
with the appointment of radical right-wing justices and following intensive um, investments by legal advocacy groups. That judicial philosophy has been shredded. And who is behind this? An alphabet soup of some of the most important organizations working in public education today, um, extremely well-funded Christian legal advocacy groups like the ADF, the ACLJ, Liberty Council, the Pacific Justice Institute. You may not have heard of them, but these organizations have combined budgets of over $100 million per year, and they have public schools in their sites. At present, there are well over 3,000, as I mentioned, good news clubs in public elementary schools, elementary schools kids. The centerpiece of their program is called the Wordless Book. It's used to convert children who are too young to read. So they're focused on the K through five and K through six schools. But as problematic as this is, perhaps the most important thing I learned as I did my research for this book is that the Good News Clubs are just one among dozens of similar initiatives and all have the same ultimate objective. Let me give you a quick rundown of some of these initiatives. There are groups running around promising to teach the Bible from a literary or historical standpoint um, as uh, four uh, credit courses in public high schools, but it turns out that they are run by fundamentalist sects. And the, uh, what they teach, in essence, is that if you don't read their Bible their way, then you are damned to hell. Thanks to that 2001 Supreme Court decision that I mentioned earlier, there are groups that have learned how to plant or actually establish churches inside our public schools, including a public school that I sent my kids to when we moved to New York City. They pay no rent. They just pay a tiny fee to the custodians union that partially covers the cost of cleaning the classroom when they're done with it, or the auditorium and you know the rooms that they use, the bathrooms, or whatever. Um, they call that rent. That's like me living in an apartment building and hiring a cleaner and paying him or her, you know, just a partial, a partial amount of their fee and stiffing my landlord and calling that rent. And they're so good at manipulating language. So these churches are essentially taxpayer funded. And like the Good News Clubs, they exploit their proximity to children and school communities to spread their message. Another way that religion is seeping into public schools is through so-called character education programs. Lecturers, theater troops, even rock bands sometimes enter the schools claiming to teach about um, the evils of drug addiction or drunk driving or other useful topics, anti-bullying and such. But it soon becomes clear that it's not about bullying or drunk driving or drug abuse. Instead, their real aim is to convert children to their form of religion. Faith-based sex and education, uh, sex education, uh, uh, abstinence until marriage, sex education programs, and relationship education programs have received hundreds of millions of dollars at the federal and state level to enter the schools and deliver programs ostensibly intended to reduce teen pregnancy. Instead, they deliver a religiously driven overlay of values and judgments. They advance narrow idea of what constitutes a moral life and they instill in teenagers sexual shame. Of particular concern is the effort to promote something known as peer evangelism, and that is getting to get kids to try to convert other kids uh, at school, maybe your kids. Now, it's hard to imagine that a church would be allowed to set up shop inside a school during the normal school day with you know, prayer rallies and distribution of uh, religious literature and, um, and uh, daily services. But according to the new legal philosophy set out by that 2001 Supreme Court ruling, um, if the kids do all those things, even if their efforts are scripted and funded and organized by adults, it's all right. It's free speech. There's a brand new program coming up in 2013 called Every Student, Every School. It is backed by nearly 60 major evangelical initiatives and church denominations including the Fellowship for Christian Athletes and Young Life, Youth with a Mission, and Campus Crusade for Christ, or CREW. So as you can see, these are major organizations with a lot of money and firepower behind them. The level of organizing, financial support, and coordination is staggering. As the name implies, their aim is to proselytize 
every student in every public school. And the way to do that is to have the kids do what grown-ups are not legally allowed to do in school, establish full-fledged missionary operations inside the schools. We haven't heard of it because it's coming up in 2013, but we will. Now in Tennessee, I visited one such spontaneous student-led prayer initiative. I went to the church that organizes students, met with the youth pastor who told them what to do, um, watched the church-made video telling students to take part, and attended an after-party um, uh, staffed by adults wearing t-shirts commemorating the event. The whole thing was student-led in the same way that a peewee soccer league is student-led. Sure. You know, it may be the kids kicking the ball, but the whole thing wouldn't be possible. It wouldn't have happened without adults behind the scenes, of course, funding and promoting the entire operation and cheering the kids from the sidelines and telling them what to do. One movement leader celebrated peer evangelism as what he called a God-given loophole. He said it, quote, brilliantly threads a separation of church and state loophole. All of this is occurring um, in the context of a massive assault on public education. As more schools lo lose funding, they become more vulnerable to this kind of religious activity. And there are concerted efforts to replace public schools with a voucher system that would ultimately serve to funnel money to private religious schools, many of which, uh, as you know, use a course, uh, uses their curriculum, books from Bob Jones University and ABECA and organizations like that, and uh, teach uh, a sort of a creationism and uh, inculcate students in uh, stereotypes, racist stereotypes and uh, bigotry and teach a Christian nationalist version uh, of American history. Um, so it's not at all surprising that the groups behind Good News Clubs and other religious initiatives are among the most vocal and active in promoting voucher-based systems to replace public schools. And we know many of our politicians are doing the same. Let me wrap up by saying something about the economic environment in which all of this is taking place. Income inequality is growing, and there are substantial efforts underway to exacerbate those inequalities. So what will the future look like for our schools, where we once strived to educate and to create economic opportunity? Will we now seek to convert instead? Will we once taught our children earth science and modern biology? Will we offer them faith-based character education instead? If we can't um, um, offer you know, moderate class sizes so teachers can attend to the individual students' needs, will we give them on-campus prayer rallies instead? In place of teaching kids how to get along with others, will we give them after-school um, religious clubs that teach them that unless they conform, they will go to hell? Will we stop giving kids education and, giving, and give them religion instead? The defunding of public education leaves schools more vulnerable to these kinds of attacks because schools can't afford legal defenses against predatory religious organizations and because people are unhappy with the schools to begin with. So what we are seeing here is a systematic effort to undermine the separation of church and state. We're working slowly toward the day when we wake up to find that our schools have become quasi-religious institutions and everyone will think that that's the new normal. I know that these are bold claims and some will say that they're alarmist. I've learned firsthand that they aren't. The work of Good News Club and Friends creates precisely those ills against which the separation of church and state was intended to defend. The separation of church and state is a way to bring peace to societies that are inherently pluralistic. But the Good News Club and its friends sow division. Separation of church and state is a way in which we ensure that education answers to evidence and reason, not dogma and superstition. But the Good News Club and its friends are helping spread ignorance. The separation of church and state is a way of ensuring that individual freedoms 
uh, sure, ensuring individual freedoms, and that people have a right to participate in society without being forced to conform to any religious creed. But the Good News Club and Friends are forcing us to support and fund their religion, and they want your kids to feel bad if they're not one of them. The separation of church and state is not just a luxury of our system of government, it is the foundation of it. Sometimes we deceive ourselves about the nature of the problems we face. We tell ourselves that a school building is just a building when it is not. We tell ourselves that education is just another transaction when it is much more than that. We have become so accustomed to the idea that collective action is never more than an attack on individual rights that we overlook the fact that there is a movement in our midst that rejects the values of inclusion and diversity upon which our nation was founded. This movement is determined to destroy one of the most successful efforts in our history, our public schools. And we may well find in a future world where the rich have their schools, the religious have theirs, the poor don't get educated at all, and everyone is schooled in contempt for those who are different, that we have kept all of our rights, yet lost everything but the pretense of democracy. Thank you very much. There's time for a few questions, so I'd love to hear some. In congratulating you on this profoundly important talk, uh, I do wonder one thing. Um, I've observed that this organization is heavily into litigation about violation of the separation of church and state in schools. Now, taking cases for individual schools where there may be prayers up in the wall or something like that may be admirable for consciousness raising purposes, but it does occur to me that limited resources for paying lawyers, etc., might better be spent on, on doing something like suing the Good News Club, because that's a nationwide thing which would affect lots and lots and lots of schools uh, and would have a profound impact and I suppose what I want to ask you is whether you agree with me that it would be better to put these resources uh, of the FFRF, et cetera, into uh, something like a nationwide effort, like suing the Good News Club, which seems to me to be an utterly pernicious organization, <laughs> rather than going after particular schools, however beneficial that may be in terms of consciousness raising. Would you agree with that? Thank you so much for your question. You raise a really important uh, issue about strategy. And, um, and uh, I have a lot of thoughts about that. One thing I want to say is, um, yes, you know, many people have said is the solution to create a free thought club. First of all, who is going to send their kids into a school, their five and four and five, or five and six year old kids to go up to their church classmates and say, you know, you're, you're really superstitious. The religious right feels no compunction about doing that, but free thought people really wouldn't. It's just not civil. Um, and, uh, you know, but uh, beyond that, I think there is a larger question, um, how to uh, address the issue of the Good News Club in a sort of a larger way. Look, it used to be the far right, in our, uh, the, the religious groups in our country uh, arguing for separation of church and state. And uh, they've managed to construe religion now as nothing more than speech from a certain point of view. Well, if you don't have separation of church and state, the flip side of that is regulation. They may uh, be arguing to put their religion in the public schools, uh, saying this is nothing more than speech. But then, I mean, what about the issue of cre creating policies, perhaps even nationwide policies, that prohibit any group in the public schools that abuse children? And looking, you know, is a group that, that goes into a public school and says uh, and tells children that they deserve to die, does, is that, does that constitute a form of child abuse? And if they say, well, this is our religion, 
you know, is it possible to argue, well, actually, you're not religion, you're just speech from a certain point of view, because that's the basis on which you got into the schools to begin with. So I think, um, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but I think um, uh, the, the best legal minds should be uh, uh, work on, on a sort of a, a larger strategy, sort of macro strategy, uh, to find a basis upon which to exclude the groups from the schools. I was reminded of a quote by Louis Brandeis. I think he said, sunlight is the best disinfectant and I think that um, the light of day is what would really um, uh, put a damper on an organization like the Child Evangelism Fellowship. Um, if, school gr if groups coming into the schools were required to make all of their training manuals public, all of their workers' compliance agreements public, all of their uh, curriculum materials public, I think there are a lot of parents who are now looking at the way the Bible uh, Good News Club uh, advertises itself as Bible study, you know, and might say, gosh, you know, I don't really want to teach my children obedience through the story of the genocide of the Amalekites after all. So these are all ideas, and uh, I thank you so much for raising that very important question. Yeah. Um, would a phone call be to the school? Would that be the best way of finding out which groups are in the school, the names of the people who are running it, and how big they are? Um, uh, would a phone call be the best way to find out if they're in your school? Right. I'm not sure. I mean, it depends on the situation. I think sometimes you could find out just by Googling uh, Good News Club and the name of your uh, community, and mm -hmm. often that material will be online by, you know, the CEF has... Uh, divisions in all these different communities, and they may put up that information online. Um, the school, uh, whatever administrator uh, you happen to get, may not actually know that much yeah. about it. It's always a pleasure to see you, and always sobering to once again visit the Good News Club issues. I was wondering if you could comment on the idea that it's time for those of us in the secular movement, both non-religious and religious, to start promoting candidates for school board and for the local community, just as the religious right did 30 years ago. Thank you so much for sharing. In Washington State, we have an initiative on charter schools. And the way it's written, a majority of teachers or a certain amount of um, parents, a majority of parents in the school can take over a school. Uh, by, they have to be a nonprofit. Bill Gates Foundation is putting an enormous amount of money into supporting charter schools. And he is not religious. It terrifies me after hearing you that religious people, parents in a, in a community, can take over our public schools. Will you comment? Um, it is, thank you for sharing that. It is deeply concerning that, um, uh, you know, when people are motivated to, you know, organize um, uh, in, in, in with their aim of um, injecting their religion into the schools, they're able to be so successful. Um, uh, I don't really get into the issue of charters uh, so much or magnets in my book, uh, but vouchers, as we know, divert money from the public school system, siphon it off, and um, often the money ends up uh, funding private religious schools. Although I have heard of an uh, increasing number of faith-based uh, charter schools as well, uh, charter schools that are not supposed to be faith-based, but that are founded by people with a kind of uh, religious agenda. Two more questions. So you mentioned people like us wouldn't be so rude as to try and send our children to proselytize, but what if instead of the Good News Clubs, we sent children and started projects like uh, the Good Noodle Club and used a fun way <laughs> to talk about the, the silliness of the FSM as well as science and reason and planets and all the fun, I guess the more, the, the reason-based, uh, but turning it and using play instead of uh, indoctrination. Thanks so much. Uh, it's interesting. You know, there are actually a lot of science clubs in schools. I went to, when I was researching uh, the first chapter of my book, I went to a school where there were lots of um, after-school clubs. And there was a science club, of course, and there were, you know, art clubs and things like that. Guess which club was offering, like, massive amounts of candy? It's a good news club. They were the only after-school club with, like, you know, a table, like, covered with 
you know, Oreos and cookies and candy and anyway. They know, you know, they understand child psychology. <laughs> My kids would do anything for a cupcake. Uh, th thank you for your work about the public schools. I just wanted to mention that they are also invading private schools. Three years ago, our five-year-old granddaughter came home. Uh, we picked her up, and, and she asked, started asking questions about sin and burning in hell forever, and, and that we didn't know what, where that came from. And we asked her, and it turned out they were in this private preschool. Uh, we wrote a letter to the owner. Uh, and she had not even thought about the diversity issue and having these fundamentalists there, and she promised she would never again allow them in the school, and we've monitored them for <clears throat> the last three years, and they didn't. One final thing, I did an open records request for all the, <clears throat> to our school district, for all of the uh, contracts for after-school use of the school in order to find out uh, whether uh, there were the good news club was working uh, in, in our school district. So that's a good way to do it. Thank you so much for sharing your, um, your experience. I, I'm One, sorry. Could, could I just very quickly add one thing? It's not just the Christian organizations that are involved in this. I was involved for many years in the Transcendental Meditation Organization. And they've involved themselves in getting into schools and teaching kids stress release techniques that then take them on to indoctrination into the actual program itself, which is not just strictly for uh, mental relaxation. I'll just address that very quickly. Thank you for sharing. There are other religious groups that do it. Um, the Kabbalah Center is one uh, that I write about in my book, and Scientology as well has done it in the past. Um, they've inserted a few programs. But the other religions, I have to say, represent a, a tiny minority of those types of character education groups that come into the schools. The overwhelming majority are coming from the conservative end of, um, of the evangelical spectrum. But thank you for sharing. And one last quick question. Okay, so we talked before, um, you spoke today, but um, I came out of this very culture that you're exposing and um, from the Bob Jones University side of things. And um, I wanted to mention just a couple um, key uh, issues to look up on Google. Because um, I there's I have a book coming out in March um, called I Fired God. And it, it kind of ties right in with what she's exposing. Um, Mind the Whistleblower it's book on Bob Jones University. Um, and if you look up on the internet, Christian dominionism, um, and start, start connecting in your minds Rick Santorum, uh, uh, Sarah Palin, Glenn Beck, some of these, all these radical uh, Rush Limbaugh, uh, uh, radical people in our country who are infiltrating our government, um, it'll kind of give you a heads up on what's getting ready to be exposed. And then just like Richard was saying um, with his first question, the book is calling the government for action. Um, and we think we have a strategic way to do that. And so hopefully, fingers crossed, um, we'll, if we can get all of your support, um, then hopefully she can piggyback another book. <laughs> and we can all you know, work together. But if we get these laws changed, um, I think that's the key too. So anyway, I'm down to that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Catherine is going to be signing copies of her book over here uh, to my right. Um, so uh, we are done for the morning, except for the book signing. And this is where you can continue your conversation with her. Come back promptly by 2 o'clock. Lunch is on your own. There's all kinds of restaurant guides in the front. And we'll have our clergy project in debunking Christian nations.